days. Well, you know, he was a relatively young man. He just went all of a sudden. After your father died in 1934, yeah. um, do you see that as a principal starting point in pursuing a career, or, or, or was it being big brother and head of the family? No, it was really the whole point, because we, we weren't a well-off family, and my father had always been very seriously ill all through his life. And when he died, I have brother and sister. They looked at me and said, we were all going to get some work. We've got to get some work. And I was the baby. And you, the family were, were not in show business? No. Uh, the same as mine. Neither was I. I mean, I did at school, like all the other ghastly children, you know. <laughs> and um, so that was it. Uh, my mother, strangely enough, wrote a letter, having seen an advert in the paper wanting children for a Christmas show, and she got a reply. And Italia Conti, the dear lady that I remember so well, she asked me up to meet her, and that's the story. I met her. She and, then, and up to this point, it was really about making sure the family survives. Well, then lives, it led to money. Winner. It led yeah. to money. Yeah. It was, that was the reason. It was yeah. money. We, we were looking for some money. Well, growing up, it was always like uh, I, I had the two brothers, Morris and Barry. The thing is, we had each other to dust ourselves off, setbacks and fall, you know. Well, it's quite unnatural that you're going to go through a large part of your life with your two brothers, yeah, isn't it? I mean, absolutely. what have you got to be to do that? Uh, and you. Because <laughs> I don't remember having many relatives when, I, when, when we were kids. Yeah. Because we were very isolated. We weren't that well off. We didn't have any presents at Christmas. So, you know, the plastic trumpet. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we were copying what was on the radio. Like, we were pretending we were, like, eight years old. We were imagining writing mm. songs for their next single, let's pretend to write their next single, still pretending. And um, in a way, we, I, I think we were a bit like the male Brontes, that we never had any friends, very isolated. <laughs> it's a very windy part of Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> but because our friends didn't share the same fascination for music as we did organically, you know, because they'd rather be outside kicking a football or you know, other evil deeds less than they maybe. They couldn't really relate to us. I mean, mm. You know, pretend, pre pretending to write songs. It was something I, they just couldn't connect with. So it was by that by nature we were sort of, we had each other. Mm. What is, in your estimation, the most <coughs> traumatic period of your childhood or a, a, an event in your childhood oh. that you can think oh, of? Oh, God, yes, well. That stands out. Well, I can think of one quite incredible thing. And that is literally leapt into my mind. And I was about um, 12, I think. And I was at school, and um, I was at an elementary school in Chingford, Essex. Essex. I was an Essex boy. Yes. And um, we had a slightly dodgy teacher. Can't remember his name. His name escapes me but he was he used to get and it was a boys school there, there was a boys section they were all boys and there was a, a girls section but he had the boys and there was a reason sound like it. yeah it became quite common knowledge in the school he used to get hold of the boys and um, sort of chat them up and try and be a bit naughty with them. And so you used to get these kids and hold them, he used to hold them quite tight, right up against him. And then he encouraged them to put their hands behind and to feel him up. Now, absolutely. And all the boys knew, but they kept it secret. Boys wouldn't talk about things like that, would no, they? No, they, they were scared. Yeah. I think if you thought that you were, if you said anything, that you, you were automatically judged yes. as being part of it, that, yes. that they weren't inflicting it. And I think yeah. that was the, the, the mindset. It was a big scandal. 
It went right round Essex, that did. I bet those kids, none of them will forget that. Incredible. Have you got one? I, well, uh, uh, mine involves actually a very bad car crash uh, where the three of us were in, in rolled eight times just outside Sydney. Probably by the time we were there. Yeah. And uh, um, it was probably, uh, it stands out because nobody came out of that road alive. And it was, yeah. we, we, there was no other car involved. It rolled, rolled eight times. And there was three of us, Barry Morris, and my father was driving with one kidney. Yeah. And um, I remember the car coming to a halt on its roof. And I, the minute it came to a halt, I saw my dad's hand go to the ignition, turn it off. And I think back to the presence of mind that he had of doing that, of stopping, you know, because he thought... Uh, what age were you then? I was about uh, 12, 14. Yeah. When you were starting out in the theatre, yeah. you were a young boy and... Uh, and innocent. Uh, did anyone try to take advantage of you uh, in those early days because of that? Well, funny enough, they didn't. Um, I wasn't afraid of it, you see, because I understood it. I was. Uh, it was it, my, my mother didn't explain it to me because she was. She would, have, you know, run a mile rather than talk about sex. Yeah. When I was in the theatre and. And as I got to understand from different people that there was this sort of strange thing that does happen, you've got to be careful. I, I, I listened and watched, and, and everybody was very sweet to me, and I didn't have any problem at all. And I naturally drifted towards women, yeah. because we always had a chaperone, and they were always pretty right. and, and lovely. And, and I never wanted to drift any other way. So I didn't get worried by it, you see. No. And I think being in our business was a help because yeah. you, you got to know about it quicker and you saw you, it. You grew you up see. faster. You drew, yeah, absolutely. You yeah. saw it happening. And it's one thing that about, about this business when you start out young is that because of all the other things that come with it, it's a great university. Yeah, I worked with some marvellous people to, yeah. to observe. Yeah. I mean, I was in... A, couple of plays with Rex Harrison, for example. You couldn't get that at school. I mean, I learned my whole life yeah. about sex with Rex. Yeah. Sexy Rexy, they used to call him. And he was absolutely fantastic. My God, yeah. did he move. You know, everybody loves you for that wonderful... For the fever film, the one with the pointing finger. <laughs> but that's what people Staying do in the street. Alive, wasn't it? But they do it in the street when they see you. you know, does they, it they do bore the, the ass off you? To yeah, me. well, it does and it doesn't. It's, it's a double-edged alive. sword, you know. There are moments. It's such a success, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And it will go with you for the rest of your life, I should yeah. And one of the aspects of, of this business, you, you start out hoping to create that kind of thing. Yeah. And, uh, and then there are times when it can it'd be irritating. Well, you can't tell by the way I use my We were very, very cautious about it because it wasn't the thing for uh, music and film together because nobody was actually singing in the film, no. thankfully. The fact is we didn't see the film at all uh, <laughs> until it came out. You got paid for it, I hope. Yes, got paid for it. On paper, I suppose that many people would like to have a movie that marries music and story together, and this one just did it at the right place at the, at the right time. It was totally unexpected. Um, it was just off the radar. How long ago was that? It's about, oh, about 20, 25 years ago now. 25 years. It's as yeah. popular now it's, as ever. Yeah, but still the biggest Amazing. selling soundtrack in, in history. Catchphrases. <laughs> yeah, now, everybody, th uh, when they think of a certain actor or, mm. or even a musician, always uh, yeah. something stands out. They go with you. Exactly, and yeah. when they think of Leslie Phillips, Audiences Gen love them, don't they? They absolutely. That's why they yeah. they latch onto them, yeah. and uh, and no less musicians. And um, with you, it's ding dong and and hello, sister. I could kiss you. Oh. Mr. Bell. Ding dong. Carry on. <laughs> how how do you feel yourself that people always automatically associate Leslie Phillips well. with those words? Does it bother you? No, it doesn't really. 
I mean, it depends who it is and where it is. Yes. And whether they're taking the piss out of you or whether <laughs> they love you. It's a punishment, in a way, for, for playing parts and using a, a kind of catchphrase. And it's, a, it's also proof of, of you've, con you've connected. You've actually reached people. Yes, it's re they're reaching you. Yeah. And uh, they've seen you on the telly, in the film, or in yeah. the theatre or something. And you, um, I mean, I, ha I have enjoyed myself with hello. Hello. That's right. Uh, uh, Hello. Yeah. Um, I, I breathe it out, you see. I've played many serious roles. I've been to Stratford on Avon, played exactly. full staff. Shakespeare. And often the audiences come round to the stage door and yeah. they just watch me in full staff. And they come up to me and say, Hello. <laughs> exactly. So it doesn't hinder you. It's at the all. way uh, I see it. It's, there's a way of like yes. instant communication uh, that's unique. It can irritate you. It, Yes, it, can. it does sometimes, especially if somebody does it when you're having dinner somewhere. And with, they do it on purpose. A, a lovely lady. They think they're, they're the only ones. And they come up and say, hello. Yeah, and they think <laughs> they're the first to do it. One actor I worked with, Kenneth Williams. Yes. I did quite a number of things with Ken. And he didn't like being interfered with. I don't mean interfered with, but he, he, didn't, he didn't like people. I, I, interrupting him when he was out. And he was, I mean, he was a great character, bless his heart. Mm -hmm. But my God, did he go. He really used to tear people apart. And they talk, oh, will you go away? I'm not going to be wasting my time talking to you, darling. He's piss off, God. I mean, all that went on. And he, he used to love those, those occasions. It was part of his joy, you know. But, um, it can go either way. Sexual mm. relationships. Um, <laughs> the word well, itself. Um, well, here we are. There's no such thing as casual sex. It's always been hard work. Yeah. Do you think women can sometimes spoil men's careers? W women never spoil my life at all. No. I'm, because I think... I really like women. I do too. But I've but heard, I also I've heard about that. But do you put, have you always put your career first... Oh, it depends who the woman is. <laughs> the thing is, fame attracts uh, much more um, than normal people, uh, the, the bounty, as, as it were. Most of your films, many of your films, yeah. have been uh, involved with women and, ch and chasing Thank ladies. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful Absolutely. roles. And great parts of the play, uh, where it involved the charmer, Casanova, the roving eye. Yeah. Has it been allowed to creep into your private life? <laughs> or has it done it unwittingly? Well, yeah. I mean, these women are very necessary, aren't they? That's what everybody wants to see, a yes. lovely girl in, in the film. I'm no woman-hater, I can assure you. I adore women. And I find it a nice it's way awesome. to spend your time. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have to spend money on a therapist. I mean, I'd pay them if I had it. <laughs> couldn't yes. get it the other, any other way. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. It's, it, it, I think it makes the audience very conscious of the fact that, oh, you lucky devil. I mean, it's the nature of the beast, isn't it? I mean, I get that in, in the streets and yeah. in restaurants and things. Oh, <laughs> you're a lucky devil, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do occasionally... Yeah get left a couple of phone numbers, I must admit, but um, I don't always ring them, but um, I occasionally do, you know, just for company. I think you know the, that. I think for the record... You know that the, sort of the, thing. I'm sure prior, everybody understands Your private life that. is always different. Uh, it's and it's disgusting, a lot more but I love it. Yeah, <laughs> I, it's more predictable. <laughs> Celebrity. In, in, the, in the sense of, of, say, what it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, the fact that, you, that television could produce a celebrity in a, in a matter six weeks of constant television. So advanced technology has actually made, created the 15-minute celebrity and reality television shows. Um, but I, what I have to say is that um, I don't see the kind of celebrity of your stature coming through by that. Shock television turning more towards 
celebrity scandal and all yeah. of that kind of rubbish is more about ratings rather than uh, who have, uh, yes uh, and also quality. in the record business te the technology allows people mm. who would never have been signed up to make records mm. 30 years ago they can make records at home mm. and they don't even have to sing the record mm. they can just sing one line have it you know mm. and have it uh, and, and the voice tune <laughs> and, and the I mean the, the artist actually can be a model that the record company sign up as long as they're good looking model and they go on the television and mime the record that's fine and yeah. the record producer do the rest yeah so in a way it's actually just become a very sort of uh, just a business uh, certainly for manufa manufacturing uh, really a reason for not paying an artist creating one that they don't have to pay mm. <laughs> because they're getting the same results because uh, the shortfall in the record buying public is due to the, the what the record companies have done themselves and the advance in technology of anything that goes on the internet and the web and uh, uh, new reduced prices has actually made it uh, a lot worse for anything of quality. But it's you couldn't do that years ago. No. You couldn't do that. You have to have a, a career. Yeah. But now you can be a star, come off the pavement, go on yeah. television, do some wonderful thing one night, and you're a star. Well, somebody tells me someone's a star, but I've never heard of them. No. Suddenly they're a star. I suppose to know who they are. Well, and you know. Occasionally, within two weeks, you never hear of them well, again. Got an interest <laughs> no, but that, 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 that's a key issue. I don't think you're, we're, going to, we're going to see the likes of, of Leslie Phillips, uh, yourself, Michael Caine, uh, Alec Guinness, coming up th through this kind of media. We're not going to get that kind of quality. It's not. Our work is real. Yeah. It's not a joke. It's not being silly. And very serious talent. It's talent and used in such a way that you make the audience enjoy themselves. I did play every part, every job. I mean every job in the business. I mean, I was a call boy. I worked in the box office. I did all those sort of things as well. Move scenery, you know. And then I've also been a star, I've been a director, I've been a producer, I've been a writer. So I've covered the whole gamut. It's a, it's like a long life. career if you're really going to be loved. And it's a difficult career if you're sensitive or oversensitive. It's right. That is for sure. And that's why I always said to my kids, you know, I, I will never push you into doing what I no. do. I totally agree with if that. You want to be a doctor? You want to be? A, you got my blessing. Theatrical families. Yeah. Do you know, you have to think of Noel Coward, don't you? And what he wrote: "Don't put your daughter on the stage, it's Mrs. Well. Worthington, and it, think twice before mm -hmm. you do it." Really, you you'd be happy that just to be, to be to be sure that they're happy to do what they want to do, mm. and I think if they know that, that then they're, they're, they're fine. It's if they think they're expected to, to achieve the same level of success as you. I think that, that's a great burden for a son or a daughter to have. The one thing I've noticed, the one solid thing right through from a kid to now, which is, you know, a long time, it's what, over 70 years, the biggest killer that brings trouble is drink. Yes. And now that comes into this business in many ways and even out of this business. Yes. But drink is a mistake. I know. Uh, I've seen, I've lived through a lot of people from very uh, early on in our career, people like Jimi Hendrix and all those people who, who couldn't see the wood for the trees. There's a lot of casualties there. And I say casualties of, of first fame um, from the late 60s uh, where they just couldn't deal with it. And, and then there are those that, that had the longer view that you know, not only did they want to have a long career but they wanted to survive and, and continue living. I'm lucky, I'm not a drinker. No. I just have never been a drinker. But I've lived with people and I've been with people that come on the stage pissed out of their mind, and it is really hell. 
It's a, it's a hard job when you're working with them. Yeah. Yeah, but it's tough for those people particularly. Yeah. I, I could tell you so many stories, but I'd like to forget them because none of them are here anymore, no. apart from anything else. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I'd love to get some of your stories. There's quite a few. Go on, <laughs> give us one. There was one show in Jakarta with 60,000 people, the governor said, uh, that he would, the, the army would take care of us if we didn't go on in the, in, <laughs> in the middle of a, a, a thunder, th thunder uh, storm, which was happening at the time. Yeah. And uh, we didn't want to go on because the live mics might strike, uh, uh, struck by lightning and uh, kill us. And he said, well, it's, it, do it, it's it. not that, it's going to be the army, <laughs> take your choice. So, yeah. um, so the governor said, we'll, do, we'll, we'll, we'll strike a balance. If the supporting cast go on, and they, don't, and they live, will you, do, will you go on? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the supporting cast lived. Uh, that was the first, deal, yeah. yes. And then when we went on, they uh, had guns pointing at us yeah. to make sure we didn't leave the stage because yeah. one particular act was shot on stage the year before. That's one you'll never forget. I was in the, a train crash in London. Uh, with hundred, nearly 100 people killed in that one. Lewisham, just outside Charing Cross. Uh, that's, that's something. Uh, I mean, they didn't have counsellors in those days to, uh, to get you through. They just had, you know, they kept people out of it. It was in black and white and kept away. By coincidence, we had our first UK number one yeah. of the night. It was November the 5th, 1967. Yeah. And I was in that train crash. That's how I celebrated that, that number one record. Like a Spielberg movie. So you can see the fireworks and they can see the blue lights. And I, of course, the train was on its side and I can see the silhouettes of all the carriages in different positions on the embankment and people screaming and shouting. And there were 100 people killed? Nearly that, about 80. And God knows how many left uh, with, with severe injuries. But the, again, there was no, there was no. Um, I begin to coming. think that probably train crashes are worse than the aeroplane crashes. Yeah, they are. You've worked pretty well without a break constantly throughout your career making yeah. films. Well, of course, I broke my career with the war. You see, yes. Because I, although I was an actor from the age of ten. Uh, I joined the army when I was 18 because the war was on. But uh, so that I missed a, a lump of a lump of my job. I mean, to the degree that I didn't really, when I was invalided out of the army, I didn't really want to go back. I thought I'd get a proper job. Yeah. You know, and now I, I, I was an officer in the army, and I didn't really. Do you think that just a part of that that kind of infrastructure in the army? Yes. Do you think there's, there's, there's part of Leslie Phillips of you now mm. in there, of that army influence? That you I have? think it helped a lot with my, when I did come back on stage. Yes. Again, I think it actually helped because yeah. I, I think it's, it's a very real thing. Well, I th always think that, 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 that uh, it's vital to people who don't do what we do. Yeah. Our job is vital to them because it gives Absolutely. them expression. It gives them, especially it, during the war. Without a doubt, I, I worked for the early part of the war, and uh, bombs dropping, and I was in the theatre. And recently, you made a film called "Is There Anybody There?" with Michael Caine. Yes, I think it was. Is there anyone there? Is there anyone it, there? No, it matters, and it's, it certainly doesn't matter to me. But what was the experience? Of well, it was film? an experience that is an actor's worst possibility. Because we shot the film, and it was, it was great fun doing it. It really was, and it was an interesting film. And s some marvelous elderly people, because it was taking place in an old people's home. And yet it was a comedy. It was really super. And everybody was pleased. And then, I was invited to the pre premiere in London, okay? And uh, I turned up premiere, everybody very happy. Michael Caine, who was the star, undisputably the star of the film, got up, made a speech, 
and invited all the character actors. It was superb character actors in that film. Really superb. In fact, the, a lot of them were so old, and one of them actually died just before the opening, you know. And it was, and it was very sad. Yeah. Anyway, I walked in, saw the director, who I adored, was wonderful, young director. And then Michael made a, f a speech. And they, in his speech, we all stood round. We, we weren't invited to speak ourselves. But he introduces us, his, his crew, you know, in the film. And we were actually going to watch this film now. So he said, and I wa would like to say, he got up to the audience, I would like to say that it's not really a film about um, old, an old people's home, really. But it, that comes into it, but it's got other factors and that was true. But it was strongly a thing about the old people's home. And I was quite surprised when he said that. Mm. And he went on saying that it's still this and that and something else. But none of us were invited to say anything. There were, there were about six or seven of us standing, all famous character actors. OK? Film started. I sat down. And as soon as it started, I thought, my God, it wasn't like that, was it? We, we shot that in another way. And before I knew where I was, and there were some nice little bits came up, I realized that they'd slaughtered the film. They'd slaughtered the characters in the film and made it much more a story about Michael Caine and the little boy that was the son of the mother and father who ran the home. And all the other parts disappeared. They, they were less interesting. And the press picked it up later. And when I saw the director, I just couldn't believe that they slaughtered everybody. It was all diminished. I think Michael was worried about him being in a film that was about an old people's home. Oh. It's as simple as that. So they minimized all that. And, yeah. and I heard him going on about it in the party after. And so, in fact, some of the character actors wouldn't go to the party because they were, they were upset. Very understandably, really. I was, I was upset. And I'd never, ever had that happen to me before. I made 120 odd films throughout my life. And that's what happened. I don't know who was responsible. I said to the director, why? Why did you do that? And he said, well, the film just didn't stand up, he said. That, that, they were his exact words. I said, well, I don't know about that. But um, I never did any more to help the film because I think we were all rather hurt. Yeah. So, uh, regrets. Let's talk about regrets. I think of only one person, really, straight away, my mother. Yeah. My mother was a very unusual woman. When my father died, she never looked at another man, ever. And she lived to be 92, never looked at one. She gave her life to me, my brother, my sister, and she never changed. She never was a theatrical mother. She no. never followed me around. She was so fantastic. But my mother remained absolutely amazing. Yes, my And sadly, came to the ghastly end. I mean, a really ghastly end. She was mugged. She was mugged in the street. And uh, three kids tried to get her hand back. And she fought them off. And she was badly injured. And she died. That's utterly dreadful. For myself, it's losing Morris, my twin brother, mm -hmm. very, very unexpectedly. And something I still haven't accepted. I haven't, That's a killer, yeah. yeah I, there's no closure for me, because I think he's, I just imagine he's, he's out there somewhere. 
uh, wouldn't, uh, and I'll bump into him one day. But to me, that's probably the, the single most uh, greatest regret that, that he's that, uh, that he's not here. And um, and that's a life sentence. But it was so sudden. I was supposed to accept it after three days. Well, you know, he was a relatively young man, and he just went all of a sudden. But and suddenly, I'm, I'm supposed to. Uh, have closure and, and uh, completely accept, accept what happened. But we're, we're not built like that, we're not made like that. And, and going to, 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 a, to a funeral, for me, was, was worse than actually being told he'd, he died, because it was actually seeing that he died. You know. Have you ever felt personally guilty about something that your work has prevented you doing? really in relation to my first wife. Um, I wasn't married, at, we, we parted, and uh, were divorced. And, um, and it was very sad, and mainly because of the children, of course. And I was in Australia with a f play, which was a big success, and I was contracted, and I was, I'd signed my contract, and we, we were packing the yeah. The halls, as you know, it's big money, isn't it? Big. And you were a long way. And a marvelous country. And I suddenly got this, this communication. She died. And, um, and was going to. You be couldn't. Make, you didn't make the funeral. I, I couldn't go. I'm, I'm a contract. I'm under contract. I mean, obviously, I asked. Right. They said, "Well, we, we, we didn't have understudies." Because you you were employed for your name, you, they can't put Joe Doe in. That's right. Do you know? No, that's right. That so I mean, I questioned it, but I couldn't. I couldn't but it, let the whole play fall on the ground. So I I had to say, look, I can't be there for the funeral, and I was never forgiven for that. Never, not even by my children. Do you feel guilty about that? Hmm. Do yes, about I do. Yeah, I do sometimes. I'm on my second marriage. <laughs> my first wife and I, yeah. Molly divorced, yeah. and, uh, and, she, and she got remarried. And but we had kids to that first family, Spencer yeah. and Melissa. That was the the, group, the bounty of that that relationship. Yeah. I'm grateful for that. It was a bitter divorce, not so much uh, financially bitter. It was um, for, you know, for yeah. the sake of me seeing the children and not being able to see them. I wouldn't see anyone. I wouldn't go. I didn't want. wasn't wasn't interested in, see, in, in going out or, or having a steady relationship or even meeting yeah. girls. It, I just went completely off for a few years. So it can have that effect. And do you keep? Do you ever keep up with your ex? No, never. Only it's my so it's goodbye, children. darling. Yeah. I will never see you again. <laughs> Is it? It, it's not good balance here. I, I don't. I think it's more like. Well, the, the, that if you have her, children, the yeah, children Spencer, will bring you back somehow. Yes. Together. Uh, hopefully, you know. I mean, I've got. I, I have no malice now. Mm. Um, the years of, you know, I've, I've weakened that. Yeah. Uh, so you know, it's pretty much the ball it would be in her court mm. if she wanted that. So that's that, that wouldn't be a problem. Mm. But um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, they've all helped to shape my life in one way or another. Yeah. But it's a difficult time, isn't it, always? Was it influenced, the breakup, because of your growing and rapid fame? Did it actually I come between you? I think, uh, I think you're absolutely right. I think it did. Um, mm. She didn't like being on her own all the time, which yeah. meant that it would be. And she, did, she wasn't the type of person with kids to be jumping on planes and yeah. following me everywhere. And she didn't want to go to the show every night or well, something no. like that. And uh, I, I didn't want to be at home all the time either. No, exactly. Either, you know, so th it's... What do you do? What do you do? It's exactly. It, you, it's, 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 uh, it's Hobson's choice, and so in the end, something's got to give. I feel regret that, that the marriage ended. Yes. But I wasn't prepared to, to give up what I was doing. The thing about it, you, you could go to the studio mm. at four o'clock in the afternoon, and there's no clocks, and you come out at you know, uh, 6 a.m. Mm. But the creative experience is that you, can't, you don't feel time mm. until you stop 
and then the adrenaline is the only clock mm. from A to B, yeah. uh, as long as it takes to create that process. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you don't know really what time it is or have any sense of time when, you, when you're doing it. The success can be the very thing that puts a stop to your private life. And so when you're not there it. and you're, you're out filming or you're, yes. you're well, in my case, out on the tour, more making a record, it could be weeks at a time, in their, mm. in their mind, you, you're probably with someone else. Yes, not, absolutely. Uh, and it's bound to annoy them. Yeah. And I mean, nine times sure. out of ten, they're thinking that it's always going to be that you're with someone yeah. else rather than in the studio. I mean, but being truthful, I think it's probably the most difficult profession mm -hmm. in the world that um, can keep a steady hand and a steady life. Yeah. It's bound to be difficult. And, of course, then you've got to be different things to different people. Yeah. You know, and it's hard to really know who, who, who I am. I think be, you have success yeah. because you, you, you've, you've made sacrifices. My second wife knew exactly what she was getting into. Well, of course, yeah, but it can be, it can be tricky. Hmm. Well, I've not altered in my attitude since I was a boy to being a young man, being in the army, and getting older. And it's my attitude is I've always liked women. I'm very straightforward. Very early on, I, I met this kind of atmosphere that you're a pretty little boy, you've got blonde hair and you're really sweet and you're going to be an actor. And so you've got to be a bit careful, you know, yeah. who you talk to and who you take sweets from. I think they were really trying to wise me up yeah. against homosexuality. And that was very, very in the market at that point. And until eventually I realized what it meant. Nothing has changed more since then to now than homosexuality. That's right. Or sex. I mean, it's completely altered. Yeah. I mean, heterosexual or homosexual is really, yeah. don't exist, it's just I mean, sexual. It was against the law. I mean, you, mm. people were arrested for things like that. When I, when I arrived back in England in 1967, it was still illegal. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it, about going to prison, it was still the days of Oscar Wilde. It, you know, and uh, it was incredible. It, was, it, it was, doesn't bear analysis. The, yeah. the changes that have taken yeah. place, and people have suffered so badly, and now, it's become even a, more of a kind of a lovely thing to be cool, <laughs> to be cool and, <laughs> and get what you want. Eh? And nobody minds. I've always liked women, and I've never been worried or even tasted anything that's called odd. I'm very straightforward, and I've never had a problem, mm. not, not a serious problem. But I've had a very great life where I found that area of my life very interesting. So what about loneliness? I, yeah. think, I think in this business more than any, yeah. there's a chance of being not alone because there, we, we... No, it's a different thing. It's a different yes. feeling. What triggers feel, feeling, feelings of loneliness? I think if I get really upset about loneliness, and I analyze it, or try to analyze it, I think I find, I find always, it's something to do with my job. I the job activated. is all, yes. isn't it, in your life, That's if you're not careful. I mean, you've got to have other people and all that, but with a, an entertainer, whatever he does, or singer, or whatever, you've got to be succeeding. If you don't succeed, if you, you go under. Yes. And if you go under, you get lonely. Yes, that's right. That's what it I think. It dictates every, all the I think things. it dictates your life. Yeah. It's the most unusual job. I asked Peter Sellers once who he thought he was, and he didn't know who he was. Mm -hmm. He said, that's why I like to play. That's why I'm an actor, because I don't really like being alone with me. Do you feel that you've missed out? Well, you know... You got your family with you at your work. I didn't have that at all. Right. I didn't have any family. In fact, 
in a way, I, I kind of l lost some of my family because I didn't have time to see them. Or I was away abroad doing a movie or something. But you have to pick up but again. But that's always been the case with you, though, hasn't it? Obviously, I had to go yeah. away and make films and be away. Yeah. Uh, same way as I had to go away and make albums and do tours. You do spend great vasts of time mm. away. I don't know if I can separate mm. my professional self because, like yourself, I've been doing it for so long. It's almost like an escape valve. But I think there is a side of us that when you are in front of a camera on the stage, you, you become a, a different person that you probably wouldn't be. Well, I suppose being an actor is living a lie. It's a thing that is natural to us, isn't it? Yeah. And we, we are intentionally living a lie. What's but you have to succeed yeah. with that lie, exactly. because do, if you do don't succeed and make the lie the truth well, to the public, you, you've, you've you, missed out. But you have to succeed, and the, and the reason is people wanted that, and that's because you, you provide with, with something that, that people really need. You being these different people, actually it's a tonic for them. It's, it, it, it's a therapy. Uh, and it's not something that it's his generation. It, it's, it's for future generations as well. It's perennial. And it could lead in from what you do professionally to what you do in your life. Without a doubt. So you, your life can change, and that can become a lie too. Do you find that with the people you know, um, as you rise in your fame, which is always happening, still happening, does the love grow more <laughs> and become more famous? Or do, does it grow less? I do you think they really love you sometimes? I think you like that to begin with. Yeah. And then you start to um, get used to it. Not that you uh, don't want it. You get used <laughs> because it's, 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 it's yeah. happened for so long. You get used to it. Yeah. You get used to being famous. You get used to strangers calling your name. And, and that's, that's kind of, you know, not normal for people that you don't know. Um, and... Um, but you, you f I mean, you have ups and downs as a, as a, as a, yeah. a, in your situation. I mean, they tremendous successes and sometimes it goes wrong. D does that affect some people you know? Um, does it? Not really. Well, it, well, you think about it, if you're, if you're songwriters, like... Of course. We are, of course. And it's not we, just you, is it? It's we, other people. Well, we can actually concentrate on writing for other artists, um, whereas we don't have to be out there, you know, bearing the brunt of, of the... Yeah. Of, 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 or fronting the record. We write for people like Barbara Streisand and people like that, and I have done Dinah Ross and... Absolutely. And, all that. and so when they do songs like Islands in the Stream, Chain Reaction, and, and people like Dion Warwick and Destiny... Beyonce doing emotion, uh, you're able to, um, in, say, enlarge upon what you're doing without having to go out there and do it yourself. Let, let them do, you, you know, let them record the song. And, uh, in the same way, you, you feel like you know, you're just a part of it, but you, except you're not performing it. Yeah, they are, but you're you're still the composer, which is a kind of, kind of and uh, a, a good feeling, really. Being an, a, an actor uh, of your standard, I mean, surely, I mean, the, the, that, the fulfillment of, of being in a position to be able to be portrayed to so many different people right up to the present day, mm. I mean, it's given to so, given to so few, very few. It's becoming a good character actor, really, and not letting it hurt it's your private part. life keep your private life going and the people you meet, the people who come to see you, people that like you, uh, and they probably like you even more if you, your lie is so truthful. The fact is, when you act, mm. you don't seem to be acting. The characters and the people that you've portrayed have always been really honest and, and yeah. believable people. They weren't the, the dark underbelly of society. I managed to get a, a, a great difference into my career as it got, as I got older, yeah. and I took chances and um, made the lies even greater. I think the dangers of it, in terms of a life, is that the dangers are if it overspills into your private life and turns you into something I think that you're true. not 
as nice as you would be without that life. I think you have to be grounded to a, to a degree of, yeah. in, your, in your private life. It can be quite dangerous, keeping up some level of understanding of what you're doing. So when the curtain comes down, you, you don't do something bloody silly, do you know? Yeah. And I, I think, think you're from person to person. Think you're something you're not. Come back to normal. Yeah. Leave the lie alone. Do, it, do it tomorrow. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. And to you. I mean, to, you I'm are. surprised at what we found to talk about. But. but you are, as I said earlier, an international treasure. And I'm honoured to have this conversation with you. And as far as I'm concerned, you are living a truth because it is to millions of people yes. exactly that. Really? Smashing. Really? You're a smashing bloke. Thank you. Thank you.